Good evening. I feel like I was up here earlier. <laughs> Amen. Praise God that we're here in his house. Amen. What a blessing. You know, I, I was, we were challenged by our pastor on Sunday to, to pray for our children. Amen. And I've found myself just praying constantly for, for not only my kids, but my grandkids throughout the week. And last night in particular, my, my 12-year-old boy woke me up. It was late at night and he said, I, I, have a, I had a nightmare, Papa. And I was able to take him back up to his room, tuck him in, and just pray for him. Just pray over him. Because, you know, our enemy, he even, he even he, he attacks while we're sleeping. He doesn't, give, he doesn't stop. He's persistent, Right? Even in our sleep. And God revealed that to my heart last night as, as my boy woke up in a fright. And, and I was able to pray over him. I was, I was able to pray God's peace over him just to give him rest during the night. And that his dreams would be sweet upon Jesus. Amen. Amen. And just I think of, you know, the influences that our kids are, are, are being pulled left and right just the attractions that this world offers to them, right? I knew you guys see it at the skate park, right, every Wednesday night. Just the lures, the lusts, the desires, you know, to, to want to fit in with their peer group, to want to be accepted. Well, you got to do this, and you got to do that, and, you know, well, if I don't do that, then I'm not going to be a part of. And just the many opportunities that we have as, as parents and grandparents, and maybe we don't have kids of our own, but we can pay, pray for our nephews and our nieces, and we can lift them up to the Lord because the enemy is, is not letting up, and we see it getting darker and darker in these last days, amen? Just the evil that is amongst us, and that much more to pray to pray for our children, to pray for our grandchildren, to pray for one another, amen? amen? Because we're all going through it, right? In some form or another, amen? So, so we're going to, with that said, we're going to look at, at, you know, we've been looking at the kings, right? The kings of Judah and the, and, and the kings of Israel. And we see that, you know, as one king died, his son reigned in his place. And when that son died, his son reigned in his place. And we, we as, as parents, some of us, we have an impact on our kids' lives. Whether we want to agree to that or not, we do. We have an influence in their lives. And it's either a good one or a bad one. And last week we looked at Jehoshaphat, right? He died. He was a good king. He honored God for the most part. And it, when he died, his son uh, Jehoram took over, right? And we looked at his life a little bit last week and how it wasn't that pleasing to God. Yet he had a godly influence in his life, his father, King Jehoshaphat. And the influence that he kind of was swayed away from God was, was due to his marriage with, with, uh, with his wife, Athaliah. And we know that Athaliah was the daughter of King Ahab and Jezebel, right? And he made this alliance with that family, with the king of Ahab, to end... Years and years of war between the two nations, right? He said, we're going to make this marriage alliance so that that will bring about a sense of peace between Israel and Judah. But I don't think he really thought it through. And the ramifications of that marriage and what effect it would have on his children for the rest of their lives. 
And that's a, you know, that's a good question for you and I. What are we aligning ourselves with in life? You know, God says that we're not to be unequally yoked. You know, our brother shared he's, he's engaged. I believe they're true. They, they follow the same Lord, right? They follow the same God. You know, a lot of us have been yoked with something that is unequal. And we're going in opposite directions. And the lines that we're sowing in life are crooked. Because she wants to do this or I want to do that. And we don't, we're not on the same path. We're not on the same page. We don't follow the same God. And we're going to see that evidenced in, in these kings' children. As they align with ungodly marriages and they begin to serve false gods. Which is a result of their end. And last week, if you weren't with us, uh, we looked at Jehoram and his life. But before we begin, if you need a Bible, raise your hand and we'll make sure we get you one so you can follow along with us. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 22. Last week, we looked at, at 21. So tonight, we're going to pick up in 22 with a quick recap of last week. And before we do that, let's pray. God, I just, as we were worshiping you, I think of how so often I'm, I'm hungry for other things, Lord. I chase after other things to, to satisfy me. Like a nice, big, fat, juicy steak. And sometimes I just gobble it up without even chewing on it. I just devour it. And I pray, God, that that, you, that we would do that with your word tonight, God. That we would just cling to every word that you want to speak into our lives. And that we would receive it, Lord. We ask that you'd fill us up, Lord. That you'd satisfy our souls with your precious word. The, the words of truth. The words of life that we would fall in love with you all over again, God, tonight. May you bless your word to us. May you speak and bring just change within us, God, that only you can do. Change our minds and our thought process. Change our perceptions. Change our heart, our attitudes. Change those things that we live for, God. Do a mighty, supernatural, miraculous work through your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So last week, we looked at Jeho Jehoram, King Jehoram, which was Jehoshaphat's son. And he was a king over Judah. He took over once Jehoshaphat died. And we see that he reigned for eight years, right? He, 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 he ruled over Judah for eight years. And while he was king, it says that he killed all of his brothers. He had five brothers. And we saw last week that he killed every single one of them. So that they would not infringe on his, his reign, right? They wouldn't get big-headed and say, oh, it's time to knock Jehoram off his seat. And, and take rule. So he took matters into his own hands and he killed every one of his brothers. And this is what he's known for in the book of Second Chronicles. He was a man that killed his own brothers. And not only that, he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Just as the house of Ahab had done for he was married to Athaliah. And I talked a little bit about this earlier. Athaliah was Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, and he was married to her through this alliance. It says that he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done. And we know that 
Ahab's house was an ungodly house. They worshipped many false gods, right? They were involved in idolatry. Just lewd behavior. Wickedness beyond measure. This is who he walked in the ways of. Despite his father's upbringing in his life, right? He saw the good, and then he saw the bad. And he chose which walk he would have. And the same goes for you and I, right? You know, maybe we weren't brought up in a godly home, but eventually God revealed himself to us, right? Through his grace and his mercy. And then then it was up to you and I to decide who we were going to walk after, right? And in this case, he chose to walk after the kings of Israel, the house of Ahab. And because he forsook God in this manner, God promised that certain things would take place in his life. And if you recall last week, there were some pretty gruesome, right? Right? He says, because of of your rejection towards me, you forsaking me, God promised to strike his people with a serious affliction. His children, his wives, and all of his possessions. And then on on top of that, God said, you'll become very sick with the disease of your intestines. So what do you think happened? You know, when God says something, it comes to pass, right? And and in fact, that's what happened. Uh, God kept his word, and they were invaded by the Arabians and the Philistines, and they carried away all the possessions that were found in the king's house and also his sons and his wives so that there was not a son left to him except Jehoahaz or Ahaziah, the youngest of his sons. And then we see that he died after suffering with his sickness for two years. He died in pain, and no one regretted that he died. They could care less that he had passed because he was so ungodly, and he didn't follow follow after the, the ways of his father, Jehoshaphat. But instead, he followed after the ways of Ahab. It says that he wasn't even buried amongst the kings. You know, and I think of my life. You know, when I was, when I was in sin and I was living in ungodliness, I lost everything. Many a times. You know, I remember getting out of prison one time and all I had was a box to my name and some letters and pictures. That's all I had because of my sin. And that's what sin does. It takes. It destroys. It leaves nothing in its path. It says that his, his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all of his possessions were taken from him. And ultimately, he died. We know that the wages of sin is death. And it's paid in full. Whether you're ready or not. And that's what happened to this king, Jehoraham. And I think of my sin and how it destroyed not only my my life, but the lives of those close to me. You know, last week, Pastor Isaac shared on how, how divorce affects a family. You know, I'm sure there's many of us that, have, that come from divorced families. And the, and, and, and the ones that suffer are the children, right? They suffer greatly as they see their dad packing all his stuff up in the back of the car and, and driving off. Where's my dad going? Did I do something? That's what I thought for so many years. 
I blame myself for my dad leaving my mom. But it was his sin that caused him to leave. And the destruction that took place in the pain and the hurt that I carried with me into my adult and young life. Right? But that's what sin does. It destroys. It's destructive. It's deadly. And it hurts everybody around you. Whether you think so or not, it has an effect in such a grave way. And that's what what Jehoraham and his sin caused him. He was stripped of everything. And ultimately, he lost his life on account of it. Because he chose to walk in the ways of Ahab. And not in the ways of his father, Jehoshaphat. You know, I think of, how can I get it across to my kids that this is not the way you want to go? This is the way you want to go. And all I can do is share my life experience with them, right? Because of my drinking and my drugging and my carousing, this is where I ended up. Please don't go down that road. There's life down this road, but there's death down that. There's a dead end up ahead. Turn around. You turn for Christ, right? Turn around. Stop going down that road. Come back to the cross. And I think that's one way we can pray for our kids, right? Lord, detour them. Stir them away from going down that deadly road of destruction and death. Give them a desire for your heart. Give them a desire to want to seek after you, a desire to want to follow after you, desire to want to serve you with their lives at such a young age. So that's my prayer today for my kids, that God would grip their hearts and that they would fall in love with God. And they would fall out of love with the things of this world. The many traps that are waiting for them. The snares. <clears throat> but this is what happened to Jehoraham, right? But despite Jehoraham's wickedness, it says in verse 7 of chapter 21, Yet, the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David and since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. Despite Jehoraham's ungodliness, God kept his Davidic promise to David. He said, I made this promise with David years prior, and I'm going to keep it, despite Jehoraham and his mishaps. Aren't you grateful that God does the same with you and I? His grace, his amazing grace. Even when I fail him so he keeps his promise to me, despite me. Isn't that good? He keeps his promise. He's gracious. He's merciful to you and I. Despite the times we get off track. And we see those glittery things and we start chasing after them. And God has to correct us and discipline us, right? Because he loves us. You know, at some point, man is going to fail you. You and I, right? But God will never fail us. He'll never fail us. It's not in his nature. If he says he's going to do something then that's exactly what he's going to do. Praise God. 
You know, my boy, he, he often reminds me of this. Yesterday, for example, I pick him up from school. He's hungry. I said, there's stuff at home. No, I want to go through the drive-thru. I go, okay. So we pull in the Arby's. He's looking at the menu. I'm like, get something, you know, reasonable. You know, I'm low on cash. He wants to order this big thing. And, and I'm like, no, just. So we start arguing. He starts mouthing off to me. I pull out of the drive-thru and I'm heading home. <laughs> so he says to me, you just, you go back on your word. Because at first I said, yeah, we'll go to Arby's and we'll, we'll get you something. And then he upset me. And I pulled out of the drive-thru. I said, we're going home. You can make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for all I care. <laughs> right? And that was my attitude. That was my heart. Because he offended me. He started mouthing off to me. And I said, how dare you? But God doesn't do that with you and I. Amen? He doesn't go back on his word. He gets us the Arby's meal deal. He says, God bless you. Right? But he often, he throws that in my face. He says, man, you just went back on your word. You said you were going to do this. You said we were going to go fishing Saturday morning. I'm like, man, I'm tired. I worked all week. I don't want to get up at four in the morning. I want to sleep in. But see, God is not like that. He keeps his word. And we can, we can, we can stand upon it. We can know that it's enduring. That it will never change. Despite us. And how we behave with God. And at times we even do this to him. And he's gracious. I thank, I thank him so much that he doesn't do that with us. And because he promised David that his line would rule forever, he spared Ahaziah, his youngest son. All of his other sons were taken, right, by the Arabians. But one son was left, his youngest, Ahaziah, because God kept his word. And that's what we're going to pick up tonight in chapter 22, is Ahaziah, King Ahaziah. As we know, Jehoram dies this painful death as his intestines come out of him. So let's read chapter 22. Let's look at Ahaziah's life. Then the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, his youngest son, king in his place. For the raiders who came with the Arabians into the camp had killed all the older sons. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Ahaziah was 42 years old when he became king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother advised him to do wickedly. Therefore he did evil in the sight of the Lord, like the house of Ahab. For they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. He also followed their advice and went with Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, to war against Haziel, king of Syria, at Ramoth Gilead. And the Syrians Wounded, wounded Joram. Then he returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds which he had received at Ramah. 
when he fought against Haziel, king of Syria. And Azariah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Jehoram, the son of Ahab, and Jezreel because he was sick. Now notice the word Jehoram here. It's also Ahaziah, just so there's no confusion. Verse 7, his going to Joram was God's occasion for Ahaziah's downfall. For when he arrived, he went out with Jehoram against Jehu, the son of Nimshi, whom the Lord had anointed to cut off the house of Ahab. And it happened when Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab and found the princes of Judah and the sons of Ahaziah's brothers who served Ahaziah, that he killed them. Then he searched for Ahaziah, and they caught him. He was hiding in Samaria and brought him to Jehu. When they had killed him, they buried him, because they said, He is the son of Jehoshaphat, who sought the Lord with all his heart. So the house of Ahaziah had no one to assume power over the kingdom. Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. But Je- Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered, and put him and his nurse in a bedroom. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jeho- Jehoiada, the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that she did not kill him. And he was hidden with him in the house of God for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Wow, what a story, huh? Talk about suspense. So upon Jehoram's death, his his youngest son, Ahaziah, takes over the throne. He becomes the king of Judah at 42. It says that he reigns for one whole year. Not long, right? One year. But we, we see in this chapter that he too walked in the ways of the house of Ahab. Just like his father did, right? Jehoram. And it says, For his mother Athaliah advised him to do wickedly. Just think of that. His own mother advised him to do wickedly. Parent, his parent. The one who was to to steer him in the right direction, if you may. She was advising him to do wickedly. And this is the influence that he grew up with in his house. How how many of us had that same influence in our lives, right? We had ungodly parents. They were doing things in front of us that they probably shouldn't have been doing. And we were taking notice of that. And then we began to try those things. Not very good teachers, right? It says that therefore he did evil in the sight of the Lord like the house of Ahab. For they were his counselors after the death of his father. So the only godly influence that he had in his life had passed. His father, Jehoshaphat, right? And now he's left with his mother. Athaliah and her family, those that practice ungodliness. And it says that this eventually led to his destruction. Second Chronicles 18:1 says, Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance, and by marriage he allied himself with Ahab. <coughs> You know, just one bad choice in life. 
and the ripple effect of that. Just one bad choice. And how it influenced Jehoram and now his grandson Ahaziah. Because he chose to make this ungodly alliance with Ahab. He was setting them up. And he didn't even know it. Or maybe he did. We know that that God sent a prophet afterwards and rebuked him strongly for making this alliance. But it was too late. His son had already been married. There was no undoing it. So he wanted to bring in, you know, and he did this because he wanted to bring peace to the nation. And sometimes I think of of our lives and how we compromise at times. I just take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I'll make this marriage with Ahab so that we We can bring peace to the nations. But he wasn't looking down the road and and what the end result was going to be. You know, and sometimes, you know, we do that at times, right? Well, I'll just compromise a little bit here. And I'll make an alliance with this, an alliance with that. We don't realize what what the end game is. You know, I, I, I talked to, I, I've had the chance to talk to, to some people at work and they profess to be Christians and they share with me that, well, I'm still doing this and I'm still doing that. I go, how is that possible? How can you serve God and serve these false gods in your life? whether it be the the drink or the drug. You know, marijuana's legal now, right? It's a big thing. So, a little bit here and a little bit there. You know, I have to ask myself, what am I allied to? What have I aligned myself to in life? What have I married myself to? You know, Pastor Isaac, he, 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 he's been sharing with us out of the Gospel of Mark. And last Sunday, he shared the concept of marriage with us. The two becoming one. And in this case, it was the house of David, or the house of Jehoshaphat, and the house of Ahab becoming one through marriage. And that's what happens when, when, we ma- when we're married to these things in life, these false gods. We become one with them. You know, I too walked in the ways of, you know, I did some evil things in the sight of the Lord. And in my case, I walked in the ways of the house of Amon. That's my last name, Amon. A-M-O-N. And I worship false gods. I took as many of them as I could. And I married myself to them. But in 1996, I cried out to God. And he divorced me of these ungodly marriages. He set me free And he unbound me of them. He delivered me from them. The alcohol, the drugs, the the sexual morality. He then became my groom. And I his bride. Amen. And he he wants to be that in our lives. He wants us to be married to him. And only him. And not to take on any other wives or any other loves, but to be married to him and him alone. 
you know, and so often you hear, hey, well, you know, I'm tired of my wife or I'm tired of my husband. I think I'm going to go out and find another one. How foolish is that talk? How ungodly is that talk? God says, no, I want you to be married to me and me alone. I will be your groom and you will be my bride. And we will sup at my table. Notice Athaliah's influence here. Not, over, not only over Ahaz, Ahaziah, her, her son, but also over Jehoram, her husband, right? In previous chapter, her ungodly influence. She advised him to do wickedly. And her son walked in her ways. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Listen, we have an influence on others. Whether you think you do or you don't, you have an influence. I have an influence on other people's lives. Especially if you're a parent or a grandparent. You know, my wife's gone. She's been gone for about a year and a half now. But I still hear my grandkids talking about her influence in their lives. Even that she's dead, they still talk about her. And they remember her godly influence in their lives to this day. They remember her and the words that she spoke into their lives. And the times that she picked them up from their mother's house and brought them to church. Sunday after Sunday. Wednesday after Wednesday. She had an influence in their lives. And she's gone. And she's still an influence in their lives. You see how impactful we are? We're impacting lives. And we can impact them for the good or for the bad. Remember, we're, we're God's witness to this world. How are we representing God to others? Through our speech, through our actions. You know, my kid, he tells me, I know what you're thinking, Papa. You don't even have to say it. I know what you're thinking about me right now. Just a look on your face. Yeah. So that speaks to our countenance. You know, we can have a look of disgust and someone, they'll, yeah, he's not pleased with me. Right? I'm learning so much from my kid about me. And how so far away I am from God. You know, we have an impact. You know, our, would we say to someone else, hey, follow me? You know, Paul says in his, his, his epistles, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Can we say that with confidence? You know, I'm not going to lead you into a, a, a pit hole up ahead. I'm going to lead you on the right path. Others are listening. Others are watching. And by honoring God with our lives, we can... We could exemplify that to others, right? In how we live our lives. You know, my kid recently is like, why do we have to go to church, Papa? Why do we got to go? I said, well, because God calls us to go in fellowship with the believers. His word declares that to us. And we're going to be obedient to that call. Because we're believers. 
And we go to the house of God and we worship as a body. And we, we're, we're built up and we're, we're equipped as we come into his house and we, we glean from his word. And we, we stir up love and good works amongst each other. How are you going to do that at home, sitting on the TV by yourself, stirring up love and good works? So I say, we're going to obey God. Our house is going to serve the Lord. And this is how we do that. So I'm able to, to share that with him. Why do we got to go to church, Papa? Every Sunday, we got to go to church. Every Wednesday, we got to go to church. I'm praying that God speaks to his heart. And he shows them why. Because God loves to, to fellowship with the body, his, his <laughs> church, his bride. You know, and it's not always going to be easy, right? Some, some things are going to be difficult, you know, as we're, we're impacting others' lives. We're going to have to take, make some difficult stands, make some difficult choices. You're not going to marry Athaliah. And we have to decide that for our kids. You're not going to marry Athaliah. You're going to remain pure to God. You're not going to be unfaithful to God. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do this. Right? And how many kids yell and scream and slam the door and punch the walls and call you names? It's difficult. It hurts. You know, my kid recently, he's been telling me, you know what? That's why I don't want to live here. I want to live with my mom. It hurts, right? When you lay, your, lay down your life for your grandkid and you stop everything in life to take him into your house and raise him the best way you can, in a godly way, and then you make him do his schoolwork, and he says, that's why I don't want to live here. That's why I want to live with my mom. I go, and I have to remind them, well, don't you remember what it was like at your mom's? It's like the Israelites, right? They were brought out of Egypt. And they said, what would you bring us out here into this wilderness to let us die, God? We had it better off in Egypt. We had leeks and cucumbers, right? But they forget that they were enslaved. They were in bondage to Pharaoh working day and night to build, to make bricks without straw, beaten, punished, overburdened, right? And I have, to, I have to remind my kid of that. You know, we have rules. We follow God because he's good. And I have to remind him of that. But it's not easy it's difficult at times. At times, I want to open the door, pack his bags for him, and go then. Right? You want to live with your mom. Here you go. Give me my key back. <laughs> no. But it's difficult, right? It's difficult at times to be a godly influence in others' lives. Sometimes they're not going to receive that well. They're going to disregard it. They're going to trample on it. They're going to mock you. Remember, we're doing it unto God. The one who laid his life down for you and I. He didn't take a shortcut to the cross, right? He went directly to it. And he honored his, his daddy with his life. For all of mankind Amen. and all who would choose him and receive him. 
One other important point is that is, is the question is, who are we receiving counsel from? You know, today I was on, on Facebook, and this thing pops up. It's in my, actually, it's in my emails. And it says, we have your reading. I'm like, what? We have your reading. So I open it up like a dummy <laughs> instead of deleting it. It's for your fu- uh, horse, uh, future fortune tellers, right? We have your reading. I'm like, What? And they're, they're infiltrating my, e- my emails, you know? But we're being bombarded here and there, commercials, advertisements, right? And we have to ask ourselves, where are we receiving counsel from? And in Ahaziah's case, he was getting it from his, his mom, right? She was, was advising him to do wicked Wickedness. You know, who are we allowing to speak into our lives? Who are we receiving advice from? Is it godly or ungodly? In Ahaziah's case, it was ungodly, and eventually it led to his demise. You know, a good rule of thumb is if you're, you're seeking counsel from others, look at the fruit in their lives. What kind of life does he live or she live? Is it a godly life? Is there good fruit there for, the, for you to allow them to speak into your life? Or is, is there no fruit? And are they always just, Complaining and is there chaos in their lives? Why would you listen to them? Right? I've I've also noticed that sometimes I listen to myself. We could be so deceiving, right? I'm on the right path. Things are good. We have to be careful of, of even listening to our, our own ourselves, right? Because we so often can give ourselves wrong advice. We're told in, in the Gospels that the Holy Spirit is our counselor. And that he will bring Jesus' words to our remembrance. Ultimately, we're to be listening to him. It says in Proverbs eleven fourteen, where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Amen. So it's good to to get count good godly counsel from godly people. You know, I have a group of people within the church body that I go to. And I ask them to pray with me. And I seek counsel from them. You know? But we have to be seeking God first and foremost. And what he, he wants for our very lives. But in Ahaziah's case, he followed their advice. He joins forces with Jehoram. He goes to war against the king of Syria. We see that Jehoram is injured in battle, and then Ahaziah goes to visit him while recovering in Jezreel. And this visit would become his downfall because he joins forces a, a second time with Jehoram, and they go against Jehu, who is God's anointed. And Jehu's mission was to wipe out the house of Ahab. That's what God had called him to do, to clean house. And in particular, Ahab's house. He says, I want you to wipe every one of them off the face of this earth. So Ahaziah and Jehoram go against Jehu, 
But we, we see that Ahaziah is ultimately killed. It says that he was hiding in Samaria, right? Notice that no one can hide from God in his judgment. Not even Ahaziah. Notice that he, he had become of the house of Ahab. He chose that, right? He chose that, that life. And because of that, he lost his life. Who will we walk after? Jesus says, follow me. Deny yourself and take up your cross daily. The choice is ours. We've been given the gospel. Ahaziah too was presented with godliness through his father and ungodliness through his in-laws and his wife. He made his choice as we must too. You know, we can receive or reject the truth of Jesus. So when Athaliah hears of the death of her son, Ahaziah, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. Her own grandchildren. She kills her own grandchildren. Talk about ungodly, right? Wicked. She kills every one of them. But Jehoash, right? God saves jo- jo- Joash. He's taken by his aunt and he's hidden in the temple of God for six years. For six years, he's hidden in God's temple while Athaliah rules over the land, right? The big wicked queen. She rules the land for six years and evidently she was unaware of Joash being alive because if she knew, she would have pursued and and killed him, right? She thought she had wiped every single uh, one of the descendants from the land. But he was right under her nose in God's temple. But she wouldn't have known that, right? She didn't didn't ever step a foot in God's temple. She was an ungodly woman, a pagan woman. But God spared Joash. He protected him within his temple for six years. And you think hope for the people was lost, right? There's no longer a descendant of the house of David. All is lost. It was a dark time. Six years of darkness as as Athaliah ruled over the nation in ungodliness, wickedness. There was no successor to David's house. She had killed off all of his offspring. Who would overthrow her? But God was working on a miraculous plan. He was putting all of the pieces together. Do you believe God has a plan even though it's so dark for you at the moment? You know, sometimes it gets dark, right? You know, year and a half since my wife passed, it was really dark at, at first. Alone, raising three grandkids, all teenage boys. It was dark. <laughs> and I was all alone. And I didn't know how, how, how it was all going to come together. But now I'm beginning to see a little bit of light. And God's shining his light upon me. But you might be in a dark place right now as the nation was during that time, as she ruled Athaliah, this wicked queen. Maybe you're thinking too, there's no hope. There's no way out of this. Do you believe he can work a miracle beyond anything seen or, or reasonable even? Six years of hopelessness. But behind the scenes, God was working. 
He's doing the same now in your situation. Trust him. Don't give up hope. Stay the course. God's in control, even if it doesn't look like it at the moment. Amen? In addition to this story, we see that David's line had been, re- had been reduced to one man, Joash. Had he died or been killed, there would be no heir through the Davidic dynasty to crown king. Furthermore, all the prophecies that predicted the Messiah coming through this dynasty would be shattered. We see how God protected that. He kept it intact through saving Joash. You know, the enemy wanted to destroy that line, right? Because we know that Jesus came from the line of David. He was birthed through that line. So the enemy thought if he could wipe out that line, Jesus would not come to this world. But God had a different plan. And he's, he saves Joash, and he keeps him for six years. And next week, we're going to look at the great miracle that God performs through that, through his saving grace. We see that God's will always prevails. Always prevails. You know, six years, it's a long time, but God's working. He's working in our lives. He's working in our situations. Things may look dark, but he's working. Don't lose hope. Don't give up. Don't throw the towel in quite yet. Wait and watch and see what God does in your very life. He didn't give up on us, did he? Why should we? Take him at his word. Take his promise declared to you and stand on it. Whether it's one year, two years, three years, six years, seven years, ten years. Hope in God. Trust in him. And see what miracle he performs in your life. He's good like that, amen? Amen. I don't know if we got a worship leader or not, but... I think Isaac's teaching in the back. So let's just stand and pray this evening. Amen. And don't read ahead. (laughs) It's a good one next week. So God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises to us. You don't go back on your word, oh God. You are sovereign and faithful to keep it. We thank you for working in our lives time and time again, and showing us that we can trust in you time and time again. Lord, I just pray your blessing over your body, your protection over them, your safety, that you keep each and every one of us in your perfect will, O God, that we would choose to walk in the ways of the Lord, and that we would just be obedient to your word, God, I pray that you'd empower us through your spirit to do just that, to not give up, to not lose hope. When things are are dark and we're being pressed in, into a corner, we would cry out to you, God. You are great, O God, and we praise you for your greatness. We thank you again for your word and the way you preserve, the way you save, the way you work out your perfect will. And we praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.